Hey everyone, how's it going? I hope you're all doing great, as I always say. And in this video, we got some more crazy stories from all over the place once again. We have a story from France, a story from Houston, a story about some security guards, and a story from what might be Russia. So, if that sounds like your cup of tea, then definitely pull up a stump and let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to my mom. And every time she told me this story, she always had goosebumps. So it was the late 1950s in France. My mom was 12 or 13 years old at the time. She's in an all girls school for like people who are less than well off for poor people. It's a day like any other, it's mid afternoon. The girls are attending a history class one of mom's classmates is named Claudette. Claudette is not focused. Instead of listening to the teacher, she speaks with other girls and laughs. The teacher tells her to calm down, but Claudette doesn't care and keeps laughing. The teacher yells at her and sends Claudette to the school principal. Claudette reluctantly gets up. She goes out of the room and slams the door shut. And three seconds later, after she slammed the door, and my mom insisted that it happened literally three seconds, not 30, not 10 or 15, specifically three seconds later. All the class can hear is the most horrific scream that they ever heard coming from the hallway, a scream of sheer terror and intolerable pain. The teacher and the girls are rushing out. Claudette is on her back in the hallway, just six feet from the classroom door, crying and screaming at the top of her lungs. Most of her clothes have been torn apart. Her shirt, skirt, socks, shoes, yes, even her shoes, and some of her hair have been ripped out in clumps. She is covered in blood and has deep and large cuts on her face, her arms, and legs. There's thirty of them or so. The teacher is in panic mode, and her face is livid. She asks one of the students to run to the principal's office. The teacher is trying to comfort Claudette. What happened, sweetie? What happened? Claudette is shaking. Her eyes are wide open. She's in an obvious state of shock. All the students are crying now. Claudette manages to mumble. It's... it's invisible. I couldn't see it. It's still here. It's invisible. The principal and other teachers arrive. They take Claudette out of the school. In the following days, the principal told the kids that Claudette was fine as she was resting for a while. But she never came back. Nobody ever saw her again. Very soon it became an official policy that nobody was even allowed to mention the story or her name ever again. Forty years later, my mom still couldn't figure out how something could have done so much damage in only three seconds. She always said it was like she had been attacked by a wild animal while being caught inside a tornado. So around 2014 or so, I was screwing around on the internet with my Polish friend. We head on to what we considered to be the dark web, like the hidden wiki, Anonchan, etc. On a non-chan, some dude posts a link in some Cyrillic script with lots of exclamation points. Lucky enough, my buddy reads Russian. He translates it. It says, it's up again, hurry. And we think, eh, why not, it's a link. So we click it, and here's what we saw. These three dudes were in military uniforms. They were shown only from the neck down. They're speaking excitedly and super high-pitched, or maybe nervously, in Russian. My friend reads Russian better than he speaks it, but he manages to catch a few phrases. Basically, these guys are scared and excited. They're talking about getting another one, etc. Eventually, it becomes clear that they're out on the ice in some random-ass lake in Siberia, ice fishing. After a few minutes of nervous chatter, assault rifles start going off. The camera swings around wildly and eventually focuses on a poorly lit hole in the ice. There's a gurgling and splashing noises that are coming from it. 
These dudes and others are just straight pumping bursts down the hole. Eventually, after a few minutes, these dudes use these long hooked poles to dig around and then heave something up. And, I shit you not, it was like a 20 plus foot long fish-like snake looking thing that was at least 3.5 feet in diameter. I'd say it was some kind of anaconda, but it was brown and had really nasty flabby fins on the side of it that they grabbed and stretched out. They were full of steel lice and holes and stuff, and had big black eyes and a mouth full of the gnarliest teeth I had ever seen. It had these huge air sacs on its underside that looked like a lungfish or something. The video cuts to a series of photos of the thing, better lit than the video, presumably because they're shot with flash. It had molted brown skin with plenty of blood smeared all over it from the bullets or scraping the sides of the hole when they pulled it out. One of the pictures showed what I'm guessing was the contents of his stomach, and there were all sorts of weird things in there. Basically, don't go swimming in Russia. I've been meaning to share some stories, but I just haven't had the time. I used to assist police investigations with specific crimes. I'll tell you about a 100% true case that I worked on in Houston. I'll drop enough clues so that you can Google the case for yourself if you want. But just know that there's way more to it than you'll find in any newspaper. So this was six years before the whole corona thing. So 2014 and summer. It's in Heights neighborhood. An older woman goes missing, and the case goes cold. I'm brought in years later when there's a sudden break in the case. When I come in, I conduct a little private investigation, and I discover a few things. The Heights has long been gentrifying. As a result, high-rises have begun to spring up all over the place. One company in particular had bought up a bunch of land around the missing woman's home. This company slowly bought out many local residents, basically snatching up their houses and clearing the land for development. The woman who went missing was actually one of the last holdouts. She was pretty old, and she had been living in the area for decades. She was very comfortable there. She obviously did not want to give up her home, but the company wasn't backing down. Essentially, a high-rise was built around the woman's house, closing her in on all sides. She was cut off from her other neighbors, and nobody noticed when she went missing. They did notice when a for sale sign went up in the front of her house, though. They began asking questions. A representative of the apartment complex actually responded to these inquiries. The representative basically said, the old woman is probably dead. It's a pretty strange response, right? Anyways, the house is sold, and a new family moves in. They're remodeling the home when they tear out a wall, and in the wall, they find a skeleton. The old woman, I was told, had apparently been murdered, and her body was stuffed inside the walls. Now, obviously, the police want to know how the hell did this happen, and who did it? All of this you can find in the Houston papers. Here's the weird bit, and it will sound like total fiction, but there are a number of other cases I uncovered with similar details. Anyways, I spoke with virtually everybody in the department and heard one thing from someone that I won't name. According to his source, there was something off about the skeleton. The coroner's report says one thing, but the facts apparently say something very different, but... I was never allowed to go look at the skeleton for myself. Like I said, there's much more to it than that, and I don't have time to share everything. But if you ask me, that's a lot to chew on. And I turned that over for weeks. And I found several similar cases throughout the Houston area, from the west side to the east. In fact, I'll share a quick one. Again, you can find this with a Google search. Several months after I was brought in, there was another case that I happened upon randomly, a totally different part of town, Laporte. A man's body is discovered in a golf course. The body is, quote, 
very badly decomposed. I'm told the police have tracked the movement of the body and that it had been initially stored in a storage facility nearby. The police story goes like this. Two men have a dispute. One man murders the other. The murderer takes the body and hides it in a storage facility. Then, for some inexplicable reason, the body moves to a golf course. It all sounds like total BS to me. I look around and can find no evidence that the body was ever in the storage facility. Moreover, the owner of the storage facility is dead and has been for quite some time. I'm thinking this seems to be a very convenient way to close the case. You find a body, you say it came from a dead guy's storage unit, and since he's dead, you can't investigate. End of story. And in case you didn't catch it, how on earth does the body move from the storage facility to the golf course if the murderer is dead? There were other cases like that that just didn't make any sense. Eventually, I was let go for some reason, but I continued following the crime in Houston as a result of my stay there. In 2019, a man's body is found in the street, practically in the heart of downtown. The body looks to have been dead for some time. 2021, a skeleton is found in the Montrose area. A family just finds it in their backyard, and the body is, you guessed it, pretty badly decomposed. 2022, Northwest Houston. Skeletal remains are found in an abandoned building. They appear to be a man who had been living there, maybe homeless. The funny thing about this story is that there are still inconsistencies that you can find in the newspaper articles. The police were told that there was a body out behind the motel, but when the police show up, they said the skeleton was inside an abandoned building. So a body turns into a skeleton in a matter of minutes, according to newspapers. A quote about the skeletal remains was, Investigators believe the body had been in the building for a long time. I called a contact from my previous time there. They told me that the building is often used by police for drug stings. The police had been there numerous times before the skeleton was found, and nobody reported anything. I don't know what all this means, but there's definitely something weird going on in the Houston area. So I used to work as a security guard, and I always had the taser, the baton, the clothes, the works. I had to make my bones in the company by doing the overnight patrol route. I catch the route that nobody ever wants to do, and it includes this one haunted apartment building, an abandoned shopping center, and a fun little drive through a privately owned canyon in the foothills. Being the new guy, nobody warns me about any of this stuff and just orders me to get into a car and get a move on. I get to the apartment building and grab the keys to turn off the elevator and lock the laundry room, etc. The place is known locally for suicides, murders, and is super old. So I'm on the ground floor and I lock up the laundry room at the end of this really long creepy hallway that there's no other doors on. I look down the hall with my flashlight and real quickly I turn back around and I hear, hello. And I think, holy hell, where did you come from? There's an olive skinned girl about 18 to 20 years old, long dark hair, wearing what I can only describe as a long gray pillowcase with holes for head and arms cut out. She's barefoot and she smiles. She's so beautiful but also very sad looking, I think. I recover my composure and I grin with a good officer friendly, good evening ma'am. I turn my head and shake the doorknob for the laundry room. I then go to turn back around to exchange further pleasantries and just kinda have a basic conversation. She's gone. The only door from the hallway is the laundry room that I just locked. The only way out is past me and down a 30 to 40 foot hallway and back out of the building foyer. I just, I'm confused. I sit there and kind of what to myself for a second and then I get like a bit of a shiver so I just go back down the hall. 
I make it out to the foyer and I call the elevator and ride it to the top before turning it off and lock it. These are the client's rules, not mine. The clunker even had one of those old-timey accordion gates on the inside. I turn to start walking down the hallway to the stairwell. The door at the far end of the hallway is open. Not wide open, but just enough to see inside. I remember the client's note to lock the door if it was ever found open. I grumble to myself, thinking, what were these people born in a barn? I stick my head in the doorway to make sure that the room is empty before closing. The room is completely bare, a hardwood floor and faded wallpaper. The single small window lets some moonlight in. I take a step into the room because I still feel like that somebody is in there. I take another step and I take out my flashlight again. Literally, it's a small studio with a single window, nothing else. I'm kinda WTFing all over because I never feel like this and I never have. I look up at the ceiling and I see the cross beam of the building cutting across the room. As I stare up at it, I suddenly I feel this tightening on my throat and a wave of overwhelming despair crushes my chest. I feel like a rope is constricting my airway. The room suddenly rushes to this icy cold temperature. I stumble backward. I catch my heel on the door frame and I land on my ass out in the hallway. The door which I had opened wide to look into slams shut and then the lock clicks. And I think, oh hell no. I spiral down all five flights of stairs and out into the street before I knew it. I turn to look up at the building. There's a dark haired girl that's the same one from the laundry hallway is looking down at me with that smile from the top room floor, backlit by a lamp. She turns away from the window and the light flickers out. It took me an hour and a half and a pack of cigarettes to marshal myself into driving again. I talked to my friend in the company afterward and he apologized. He said that he would have warned me if he knew that I got that route. All the old timers know not to check the room. He said if it does get found open, there was a stick with a hook on it in a closet down the hall to pull the door closed. No one ever tries to lock it. And I think, oh well, screw me I guess. So a few weeks later, I have to do patrol through that privately owned canyon that I mentioned. I got warned though from my friend about this one and for some reason I'm required to carry a firearm, which didn't make sense to me. The road through the canyon comes off of a suburban street. The canyon entry is blocked to the public by a chain link fence and a massive steel gate. Literally a 20 foot tall, 40 foot wide, 3 inch thick steel gate. Around the office it is referred to as our Jurassic Park account. The client demands an armed guard patrol up the dead end of the road and back down. The issue cited reports of prowlers, suspicious noises, and transients and stuff like that. And when I say that the briefing papers literally had transients in quotation marks, I'm not kidding and I probably should have known then. So the FNG, the new guy, me, has to go to this account. I open the chain link fence and I drive in, and I shut the chain link. Then, I'm to muscle open the Jurassic Park gate, start driving up into the canyon. Mind you, it's 1am and pitch black. I'm driving at 5 miles per hour, with a car lit up like I'm signaling to space. The cliff's on one side and there's a rock face on the other. It opens into an area with scrub woods on one side. There's a tunnel up ahead, but just before I realize it, there's this shape up ahead that looks like a deer. So, I drive into the tunnel, and I have my handgun on my lap at this point. I drive out and I think I hear a scuffle from around the bend in the road. There's twigs snapping, there's leaves, and rustling along the road next to the car. I turn my spotlight towards the weird shadow that pops out just for a moment. And I think, oh my sweet baby Jesus, or whoever will listen to me right now, please let this be a deer. And I see, not a deer, but the rictus visage of a humanoid. Gray skin, beady eyes, no clothing, 
skeletal, almost. Its head snaps up and shields its eyes from the spotlight before yanking a broken deer carcass to behind a tree. I open my door, my gun pointed. I scream for it to come out. Silence. I think, oh shit. I get back in the car and I turn right back around and drive down to the Jurassic Park gate and I call my partner. My partner calls the boss. The boss calls me an idiot and calls the client. The client demands my number from the boss and calls me to have me explain. He gets really excited and tells me to lock the Jurassic Park gate and leave immediately. And I think, oh, whatever you say. The client puts the phone down but doesn't hang up right away. I hear yelling that the guard company found it near the tunnel. And then the phone hangs up. At the end of that month, the client closed the contract and paid out the remaining fees and breach penalties like it was nothing. I ended up signing an NDA and getting a $500 bonus, and I get called an idiot by my boss again. I went out for a drive with my work friend to find the Jurassic Park gate again about six months ago. Uh, we pulled up and the gate is gone. The road is open. There's cuts all the way from the road and up to the tunnel. There's no more woods, and it's all down into another neighborhood. And it just made me realize how weird this job was. But let's go back to about two to three months after the Jurassic Park account happened. I get a call from my work friend. He says that he's working on another route that night, and he got a call from the boss that an alarm is going off at this abandoned strip mall that we service. And I think, why not? I'm just driving around right now and bored, so I'll roll in. I get there just after my buddy, and I'm going to call him Tiny, just for complete irony's sake. He's actually huge. Tiny waits for me to hop out of the car, and he unlocks the gate. The place must have been a space theme or something when they designed it. It has this all-white facade with a bunch of curves and angles. It's a two-story plaza with stairs an elevator, and a walkway. Anyway, we go around and we pull a couple doors, and nothing's been broken. Suddenly my phone rings and it gives us both a start. It's the boss, and he literally yells, What the F did you do? As soon as I pick up. I pull down the doors, boss, honest. He goes into this tirade about the client calling him saying the fire alarm is on, the break-in alarm is triggered from all sensors, and the elevator entrapment alarm is going off in his setup at home. The site is quiet. We don't hear an alarm. My work buddy gets on the phone and tells boss to get off my back. Nothing's going on. The client's system must be just faulty. He hands me back the phone, and boss says that he doesn't give a shit if anything is broken. I'm fired. He hangs up on me. I start taking pictures as my work buddy opens the security breaker closet thing. The elevator at the end of the hallway dings and opens. It's pitch black inside the elevator car. We both shine our lights into the car, and it doesn't break the dark. We can't even see the back of the elevator. Tiny draws his gun and walks forward toward the elevator with it hanging down by his leg. I say his name real slow with a question mark at the end as I draw too. Just as he's about to step into this black void where the elevator car should be, my cell phone rings again and he snaps out of whatever funk that he's in and he jumps three feet into the air and says, uh, in shock. He retreats away from the elevator, pointing his gun. The elevator doors slam shut and the elevator dings. The display is showing that it's now descending to the basement. Tiny looks pissed and says, That thing tried to eat me. He waves for me to follow him and he runs downstairs to the basement. The elevator is waiting. The doors are closed. He hits the open button and steps back. His gun is leveled. Ding, the doors open and it's black again. A gaping maw that sucks up our flashlights. I'm at Nope Factor 10, and I'm shaking like a leaf. Huh, <laughs> like a leaf. Tiny pulls out a chem light stick out of his thigh pouch. I 
didn't ask, the dude carried a knife, a lighter, chem lights, a tourniquet, a first aid kit, an extra magazine, and his rig that he had on his thigh. He was a total mall ninja until he produced exactly what you needed at any point in time. He cracks it, gives it a shake, and underhands it in the elevator. There's no thud from hitting the back wall. Nothing. The light just disappears into the darkness. The elevator dings and the door shut again. Tiny races over and slaps the button to call it open again and then takes his stance. And the doors open again and it's the fluorescent lit, dark wood paneling, handrails, white floor, and everything. The regular elevator car greets us. I exhale. What in the F? Tiny puts his gun away and scratches his head. He's beyond his depth as we peek our heads in. I look up and spot a small camera in the corner and suggest that maybe we should look at the tapes. I should also clarify that when the lights came back on in the elevator car, the chem light was not there. We never found it either. So we mosey on our way back up to level 2 to take a look at the CCTV display. And this is where things get even weirder. It shows us walking around until the elevator doors open. The feed from inside the elevator just cuts to static before the doors open and comes back on later, probably when they open again with everything back to normal. There's another camera that's pointed down a hallway. It just shows me facing toward the elevator with the security room door open behind me. Another camera pointed at the elevator area shows the doors open on blackness. But the angle is tight enough that you can't even see Tiny. There's no camera pointed at the elevator in the basement. Tiny suggests that I back up the footage further. And there's just nothing. It's all over. The camera inside the elevator cuts out here and there, but nothing else. Suddenly, I remember the phone call that saved Tiny's ass. I checked the cell phone. It's a missed call from the boss, who, when we called back, of course, called me an idiot. We lock up and Tiny goes to make a report to the client via email. The elevator dings and the doors open again on the inky blackness. We both just leave and go back to our cars and take off. Tiny files a report that the alarms were triggered by a coyote that got in through the fence. The client buys the story. Every time there is an alarm after that, we yank the gates, pull the doors, and then hightail it. As long as that place didn't burn down, we didn't care. The client demoed the place the same year, and he built apartments on the site. Seriously though, screw that job. So, what did you think of those stories? Let me know which one was your favorite one down in the comments. And do you have a story of your own? I have an email in the description that you can send it to, and I'll do my best to do your story justice. And there's links in the description if you want to support the channel. And yeah, that sounds like it's about it. So I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.